Okay, BioSci 101, Spring 2021. This is Dr. Georgie, and this is the ninth lecture. We're going to talk about fluorescent spectra. So, quick history. I know I gave you an even quicker one uh, last week, and we're going to go a little bit more into the history of fluorescence today. I'm going to recap fluorescence since it's a fairly new topic for most of us. I'm going to do a quick recap of what we just learned and fluorescent, about fluorescence itself and also fluorescent scopes. And then the topic of the day is learning about spectra. So if you do have the Davidson Murphy textbook, you can find in from information on this in chapter 11 and here's some you know other links okay so history of scopes as i told you before in the 1600s um Leeuwenhoek and hook um developed some of the first scopes Leeuwenhoek developed them hook used them and um the name cell was invented to describe cork actually which was um had this had this clearly repeating structure in it. And so they said it was like the cells of monasteries and, you know, all simple, all the same size and so on. And then we continued to use microscopes to look at anything biological. And we realized that life um, is organized in terms of cells, like the cell is the basis of all living things some living things have one cell some have many like us okay so then in the 1800s there was a flurry of really important developments that include ernst abbey airy kohler stokes and zeiss and um this was for brightfield and uh scopes were kind of a party trend at that point. I mean, yes, scientists were using them, but they were also um, being used by rich people having parties as a enjoyment kind of thing. So they, there are some scopes that are pure gold and so on. It's kind of interesting when you look at the history of the scopes. And then um, there were just some breakthroughs in physics in Europe where um, a lot of people kind of came together and developed some really key components. You already learned about coloring and you're gonna learn about airy disks and Ernst Abbey, stay posted for that. Today we'll hear about what Stokes contributed to microscopy specifically. He's a scientist who contributed a lot to a lot of people. And Zeiss, as you know, Carl Zeiss and uh, the Leica lights companies um, are were really important for the development of microscopes and also commercial microscopes. So in the early 1900s, um, a variety of people contributed to the development of fluorescence uh, and fluorescence microscopy. And a scientist named Fritz Zernike developed phase optics, um, which is a type of contrast generating technique. And a little bit later, in the mid-1900s, Georges Namarsky developed DIC, another contrast generating technique, differential interference contrast, as we talked about in the beginning of the semester. And Minsky is um, credited as being one of the first developers of confocal optics. As anything in science, there were a lot of people who contributed from a lot of different angles to make these scopes um, work at all. In 1994, there was a clear moment in, the his, in history where GFP, green fluorescent protein, was discovered as a possibility to use in science. And we're going to go over that in a few weeks. So that revolutionized microscopy because to be honest, until then, yes, it was useful. Yes, we learned a lot. But the discovery of GFP took it to a whole new level, and there's this there was this renaissance and revolution where suddenly microscopes were used by everybody for everything because GFP made it possible to look at live 
specimens in biology. And in biology, what we really want to study is life. And so the biology is the study of life. So being able to defluorescence um, with life specimens that at will, if you will, that we can control and select um, led to this huge renaissance of imaging where suddenly everybody was doing it. Um, and it has made its way into diagnostics, imaging and fluorescence imaging, I should say in particular. And, um, and also, <laughs> I don't really need to add to this, we're under, right now, we've got a super resolution um, revolution happening. So we're in the middle of yet another key moment in fluorescence his, uh, uh, microscopy history. And I'll talk about that in the end when I talk a little bit about confocal and then what, you know, confocal microscopy and beyond. So fluorescence has its own history. It was discovered in the 1500s in plants by one artist. And in the 1800s, George Stokes did experiments um, and I'll, he did a lot of different kinds of science. So you might come across them in different classes. Um, also using plants. And um, he named it fluorescence, however, after a rock, floor spar. It's a very pretty green, purple, um, slightly transparent rock that if you're into rocks and gem shows and so on, you've come across it. And so rocks also do fluoresce. Um, and um, Stokes, there's a lot of, uh, like I said, there's a lot of science that um, he came up with that's really important. And there is the Stokes law that the fluorescent material absorbs one wavelength and remits a longer wavelength. You already know this from before, right? You know that um, the emission and excitation are, the, are linked in the sense that the emission wavelength is always to the right, if you will, on the uh, um, color spectrum of the excitation flora, um, wavelength. Okay, and we're going to go over that again a little bit. So fluorescence, just, uh, I'm going to go through this really quickly because it's basically a recap. So absorption, when light hits something, matter, um, your specimen, basically, it can be many things. And one of the things that can happen to it is it can be absorbed. And um, whatever's left is transmitted or reflected. And if it's fully absorbed, then the light is not transmitted. And you're going to see the reduction of amplitude because some of the light is basically going to stay and interact with the matter. So not all of it can come back out. So when it's absorbed, what What's going on with that light that does get absorbed? Lots of things. Fluorescence is one possibility of many for absorbed light. And it only happens if the specimen is, if the molecules of the specimen are particularly suited to fluoresce. So not everything can fluoresce, not everything does fluoresce. It's a limited subset of molecules that when they, that first of all can absorb light, and then they do, they fluoresce, they re-emit it as light as of a longer wavelength. And this happens pretty much immediately um, within fractions of a second. If it is longer, um, seconds, even almost minutes, um, then we call it phosphorescence. There's different chemistry that's happening. Um, and then if it's even slower and it's um, radiated out as heat, as infrared waves, that's something that can be happening concurrent to fluorescence and phosphorescence. And of course, um, when light is absorbed, it can, it, it can break bonds, break chemical bonds. So you can use lasers to do surgery, for instance. So it can be transformed into chemical energy and alter the chemicals permanently. Fluorescence note that it just uh, excites the electrons of the particular part of the fluorophore that is fluorescing and it gets them all excited and then they drop back down to the regular state. So it's just a moment in time where they're excited and then they radiate out the light that they've absorbed, only they radiate it out as less energetic light because some of it goes off as heat. 
All right, and that's what I just described is described uh, by the Jablonski diagram that if something can fluoresce, if it's a fluorophore, then the electrons in you know the part of it that is fluorescing are situated in such a way in the molecule that they're able to absorb light of a particular wavelength, not all light, not any light. They, they're very picky about the color. And they're gonna absorb this light, get all excited, and then drop down back to their regular state by releasing some of the energy as heat, and then also releasing some of it as light again, uh, but light of a different color, because it's less energetic now. And that's Stokes' law. It's just, it has to be that way. You cannot have red excite green. You can have green excite red, because green is higher energy and red is lower energy. Remember, higher energy is also um, a shorter wavelength because it's higher frequency. So lower energy is a longer wavelength. And um, yeah, that's it. Oh, and it's less frequent. Long wavelength, less frequent are the same thing, basically. OK, so fluorophores are molecules which fluoresce. Fluorochromes are fluorophores that are attached to another molecule, like a protein or an antibody. Or sometimes it's the part of the entire fluorophore that fluoresces. It depends who you ask. Um, I'm choosing to just call things fluorophores, but it's not wrong to call them fluorochromes. And if you get a job and your boss says, calls it a fluorochrome, go with it until you're, you have seniority. And then you can say, well, I prefer fluorophore or have an interesting discussion about it. So every fluorophore, so every molecule that fluoresces has a particular excitation wavelength that we can, we describe in nanometers and a particular emission wavelength. We also describe that in nanometers. And so we know this, we can figure this out. We can actually use our confocals to figure it out if we don't know it. Um, it's not that hard to figure out. You basically shine light at something until it fluoresces, if it does, you know, or you try all the colors of light and it doesn't fluoresce. Okay, there's your answer, it's not a fluorophore. Um, so, you take a specimen, you check it out, you take a molecule, you check it out. Um, it's very doable. You basically shine light and see if you get a response. And if you do that, it's because there are some parts of your specimen that are particular molecules that happen to be fluorophores. In a specimen, of course, you can have multiple fluorophores. For instance, in cells, the cell wall fluoresces in response to a certain color because of the linen in it. And who knows, actually, this is still an open question, other things. Um, and then you can have the nucleus fluorescing differently or vitamins fluorescing differently, as you might have heard at the um, AIM talks. So when we're talking about a particular fluorophore, not a specimen that has lots of them, maybe or maybe no fluorophores. But when we're talking about just a fluorophore, a particular fluorophore, we can define its excitation and its emission wavelengths. For instance, Fitzy, the first fluorophore that was used in fluorescence microscopy and is still around, has an excitation of 494 nanometers and emission of 518 nanometers. So every fluorophore that you're going to use or come across in biology is going to have a defined excitation and emission, unless you're dealing with autofluorescence. But even then, you're going to figure it out. So if there's a fluorophore, you should be able to know its excitation and its emission wavelength. And the Stokes shift is the difference between the two. So it's the difference between, we call it the peak emission and the peak excitation. So just subtract, for instance, for Fitzy, you subtract um, 494 out of 518. So 518 minus 494 equals 24 nanometers. That is the Stokes shift of a particular fluorophore, in this case, Fitzy. So every fluorophore has a characteristic that they have a particular wavelength that um, works for them, that it excites them, and they have a particular emission wavelength, the light that they produce after they've absorbed the other color. 
the difference between those two colors is the Stokes shift. I told you about the Stokes law before, which is basically this, you know, the direction of the Stokes shift, right? That the emission is always going to be a longer wavelength. So here you're doing emission minus excitation. That's all you do. The longer wavelength, the one that you receive, the one you see, which is less energetic and longer wavelength, minus the one that you gave to the specimen. You uh, bought an expensive white source and some filters and uh, directed them to the specimen. So that's your excitation wavelength, the one you've worked hard to, to provide to the specimen. Um, it's always higher energy and uh, more frequent and a smaller number because the wavelengths are coming close one upon the other, okay? So again, Stokes shift, emission minus excitation, that's the nanometers, um, the difference in nanometers. Remember, visible light is 400 to 700, so it's gonna be 700, minus something. It's going to be in those <laughs> numbers, right? Every um, every fluorophore you're going to come across is mostly visible light. There's some UV and IR fluorophores, but for now, let's just think about the visible light ones. And uh, you're going to get a certain stoke shift. The stoke shift is actually very descriptive. And um, as you'll see, a very useful number to, to know. There, just the way physics works out, the stoke shifts tend to be kind of around the 20 nanometers or so range, um, just chemistry, physics, et cetera. And we often need to know it because we're trying to view more than one fluorophore at a time on our specimen. That's called multiplexing. Yes, just like the, the um, movie theaters that used to exist, <laughs> may still exist, we'll see. Um, so multiplexing is when you're not looking just at one fluorophore, but multiple fluorophores, usually ones that you've added to your specimen um, so that you can see different portions of the specimen. For instance, a fluorophore for the nucleus, you know, that labels DNA, a fluorophore for the mitochondria, a fluorophore for the actin, et cetera. So um, we actually, uh, oh my God, this, <laughs> I'm looking at this and this is an error that I, this has persisted for 10 years, even though I correct, I sort of edit my um, stuff every time. We want, um, we actually want a smaller stoke shift. So y'all, you know, take out your pens. I hope you're writing notes or digital notes or whatever you're doing. I can't in this recording correct this, good Lord. But actually we don't want a big stoke shift. We want a small stoke shift. So the smaller the stoke shift, the better. Um, so that was probably gonna be a quiz question y'all because, you know, um, that, that's making sure you're paying attention, taking notes. So I apologize for this slide, but it is, we do like small stoke shifts. We don't, 24 nanometers, okay, something in that range. If it's a hundred nanometer difference, which is rare, fortunately, it's gonna be a problem to have more than one color. So we tend to look for smaller stoke shifts. So the smaller, the better. Um, and that, plays into having filter sets that separate out excitation from emission, et cetera. There is too small and there is too too big, to be honest, actually. Maybe it's it, it's not that clear cut. There's a nice size for a, a, a stoke shift. So there's a right size, let's put it that way. Um, and usually the problem is they're too big when we're trying to develop new fluorophores or pick a fluorophore. So we don't run up against too small very often, but it could be too small, it could be too big, we want it just right. Um, and again, excitation is a lower wavelength, more energy to the, um, I don't know, I think this is backwards to the, looking okay, to the right of emission, wait, excitation is to the left, yes, to emission. So uh, it's easy to get turned around when I'm talking. Excitation is more towards the, 400 and emission is more towards the 700 end of the 
a visible light spectrum, let's just call it that. And excitation, sometimes people call it absorption. So you might see absorption and emission. Most people say excitation and emission. Again, it's all correct. It's all the same thing. So on this scope, we're going to need um, filter cubes to control the color of light that we're giving the fluorophore. We're going to need an arc lamp in an old school fluorescent scope. It's basically a super bright illumination source. These are still around. There's lots of rules about uh, safety around them because you need to turn it on and keep it on for almost an hour and off for an hour is the rule around arc lamps. I'm realizing since we didn't train you on the Olympus scopes, I haven't mentioned this. And um, they tend to have, well, they have the potential ability to explode when um, <laughs> when uh, they're at the end of their lives and um, they could release mercury glass if they happen to be a mercury arc lamp. So they're not things that you take lightly. You have to know what you're doing around an arc lamp. Um, if they explode, you evacuate for an hour until they are, the mercury gas is gone um, and you would hear it. So you would hear a pop and then you would know, you would just leave. Um, I've yet to meet someone who's <laughs> encountered this, but it is technically a possibility to keep in mind. So um, arc lamps should be you know, treated carefully. Um, okay, so we have a very bright source that is often on arc lamp these days. We're finally getting LEDs that are bright enough. It, it's a new thing. Um, and then we have, of course, objectives that are specially designed for fluorescence. Um, so they don't have autofluorescence and they have a very high NA, which we haven't gotten to yet, but just bookmark that in the back of your head. Um, they tend to be nicer, fancier objectives while you're making sure that there's no autofluorescence in the optics, you end up having you know, it's sort of like if you're doing fluorescence, you're going to end up having a good objective. You're going to invest in it. Um, with fluorescence, as you know, the objective acts, acts as the condenser. Um, so on the on the scope, the reflected light and the transmitted light have very different light paths. The reflected light path is the one for fluorescence. Um, with fluorescence, you don't really have to color because the condenser is the objective and it's always aligned. <laughs> if you can see anything, it's aligned. There's not a separate condenser that tends to wander off. So a lot of people learn how to image on a fluorescent scope and that I think that's part of why they don't know how to color, even though every fluorescent scope that I've encountered so far has a transmitted light source and pathway too, because you might as well. It's the fluorescence part is more expensive. So of course you're going to have a regular transmitted light um, set up on your scope too, just to find things and you know in case things aren't fluorescing. Um, they are starting to make some automatic scopes that don't necessarily have anything. But most scopes, you're going to always just have a transmitted light path because gosh, why not? <laughs> you know, if you have a fluorescence um, objective, it works just fine for transmitted light. It's just like a really good transmitted light objective also. Okay, so people learn on fluorescence and then they don't realize how to use the transmitted light properly, but you guys are way better than that. Okay, so in the filter cube, as you might remember, there is an excitation filter. It lets only the excitation um, wavelength pass through. So white light becomes colored light. The emission filter only lets the emission wavelengths pass through. This is also known as a barrier filter. It's just kind of an extra backup so that we know we're controlling everything and seeing what we want to see and we know what we're seeing. We know what, what color of light we're looking at, even though our camera is black and white because it's more sensitive. So then there's also the dichromatic mirror, also known as the dichroic, also known as the beam splitter, one of the best names in science, beam splitter. It just sounds great, right? And it reflects, but does not, in other words, does not transmit the excitation wavelengths, and it transmits the emission wavelengths. 
This is the diagram that I had for you last week. And um, this week, it's the same drawing, I think, but this week we're gonna get a little video, which I think is really helpful. So here's a specimen. There's a slide, there's a specimen. We're gonna draw it in any moment now. And of course, that's an objective. And oh, that's your filter cube, right? With the beam splitter also known as dichromatic mirror. There's the emission filter. There's the excitation filter. And oh, we finally came to our light source. So let's start here. Let's shoot out some light. Let's go light. All right. OK, light source. We turned it on. It's an arc lamp. We're going to keep it on for an hour. By the way, there's always a little log next to it when somebody turns it on, so you know. Um, so we've written in our logbook that we're turning it on. We turned on our arc lamp, gave a little time to stabilize, 10, 15 minutes. And then we open the shutter, yay light, super bright light because arc lamp, it's an arc lamp. So that light has many colors in it. And when it hits your excitation filter, in this case, the green light is reflected, it's bounced off. The red light, try and guess what? This is a blue excitation filter. So think about it for a second and then see if you were right. Yep, the red light rejected, does not get to go through. Bye-bye, go back into the room, bounce around the scope, whatever you wanna do. Red light, not coming in. Green light's not coming in. Guess who's coming in? Guess who gets transmitted? Yep, you guessed it. The blue light, because it's a blue excitation filter. So blue light goes through. It's not just any old blue light. It's every filter has the exact you know, type of blue light. It has it down to the nanometers, right? But for our example here, we're just going to call it blue light. And it's going to keep going like light does, just keep going forward until it hits our beautiful beam splitter mirror. That beam splitter, as you might remember, does it reflect or transmit the blue light? Think about it for a minute. Where would the blue light go if it transmitted, if this mirror transmitted it, let it go through? And where would the blue light go if this mirror did its mirror thing and reflected blue light. And yes, this is a special mirror that works with these two filters. Remember every um, set of excitation and emission filters has um, their own mirror that goes with them. So you guessed it, the mirror is going to reflect the blue light because that will shoot it down to your specimen. It goes through the condenser, which is <laughs> actually the objective. And then it's going to hit your specimen and they're going to finally draw the specimen for you. Come on, let's draw it. Let's see it. Oh, right. A little bit bounced or went, was transmitted because nothing's perfect. Um, so that mirror, that beam splitter is pretty awesome, but it lets some of the blue light around. And, um, and it's just showing you there's blue light everywhere. <laughs> okay, So this is a super careful drawing. It's true. The blue light might bounce off. Might, there's, you let the blue light in, it's going to go where it wants to go. Fortunately, most of it, I think it's going to, yeah, it's going to show you why you need an emission filter because some of that blue light, it might have been the same one that was transmitted. It doesn't necessarily come from outside or from the specimen, but some of it um, might head out to the emission filter, but you guessed it, it's gonna be rejected. Oh wait, it's not even gonna show you that. It will not pass through the barrier or emission filter. Okay, now we're gonna, um, now that we know that the blue light, yes, it's bouncing around, but most of it is coming down to our specimen and it's not getting out of that filter cube <laughs> as far as we're concerned, okay? We're not gonna see it again. Um, it's not making its way to our eyes or to the camera. We're gonna uh, look at what's happening with the specimen. There it is, finally, there's your cheek cells that have been uh, transfected with GFP or something like that. So you've got a transfected means you've added uh, DNA uh, to produce the GFP protein. So 
anyway, you've got your specimen that has a fluorophore that is, let's say, GFV, for instance, green fluorescent protein, or it could be Fitzy, which we just talked about. Um, so there's your little specimen cells, something. It's going to absorb the blue light. It's going to absorb that particular uh, excitation wavelength. And it is going to have the electrons get all excited for a moment and then quickly ah, back to normal, giving off some heat and giving off some green light. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, which, by the way, it's light. It goes where it wants to. Does it know that you want it to go into the objective? No, it goes out in all directions because it's light and can travel freely. Fortunately, some of it does go into the objective and get captured. This is a big problem in microscopy. We want, we want to capture as much as the light uh, as possible, as much as the green light in this case as much as the emitted light okay so um hopefully we have a really good objective and um, we do a good job of capturing as much as possible of the light coming off of this specimen that's fluorescing and it goes straight through our objective because it's a fluorescent objective so it's beautifully suited to this purpose and well it hits our fabulous beam splitter what is going to happen here? Is it going to be reflected or transmitted? Where do we need it to go? We need it to keep going towards your eye, towards the camera. So thank goodness our, what? <laughs> I hit a bat key. Let's watch this again <laughs> really quickly. <laughs> okay, here's the green light going everywhere, including to our beam splitter. And now it's gonna go through the beam splitter. It's transmitted through the beam splitter. Hooray! <laughs> That's because um, we want it to go in that direction. And you can see how the beam splitter is sending the blue in one direction and the green in the other direction. Okay, it's like a traffic cop for uh, colors of light. And, um, this green light that we worked so hard to create and then capture has now hit our emission filter. Do we want it to go through or be blocked? Well, we want it to go through. We want the emission filter to let the green light through because that's what we want to see. That's what's going to be our image. And then, um, you know, this is my Zoom is covering the top of this, but I sort of remember. Anyway, there's your eye is up there or um, a nice CCD camera or these days a CMOS camera, some sort of camera, some sort of, um, what, you know, in the old days film, some sort of way to record the image. And again, you've, you've blocked the blue light. It has mostly gone down to your specimen you've created green light. Well, you haven't, the specimen has. <laughs> specimen is worked hard to create the green light for you. And that enough of it for, you know, a lot of it went up, up and through um, the scope, you know, through the objective and through the scope and, and off onto your retina or your camera. And I actually, that's interesting, this button, uh, races it all. Let's watch that one more time because I really want you to get this down and understand this well. So we start with a white light source, super bright because we're getting rid of all the other colors we don't want, like red and green in this case. And um, we still need to have enough blue because <laughs> it still takes a lot of light to get anything to fluoresce, by the way. Um, not just a, you know, it's not just the right color. It's also, you need a lot of it. So we've got our nice excitation filter that transmits only the color we want. Their beam splitter directs it down to the specimen by reflecting that same color. And then the specimen fluoresces. And you've got, in this case, green light that the mirror lets pass, the beam splitter lets transmits, and the emission filter also transmits only the color that you're expecting to see, only the emission color of your fluorophore, and then you capture that image. 
All right, there it is. Okay, that was a recap of stuff you already pretty much know, actually. But um, because this is new to a lot of people, I like to, you know, tell you over and over again, because repetition helps us learn. And that's how that's a story I told you so far is every fluorophore has an excitation and an emission wavelength, like 495 and 518 for Fitzy, for example. Yeah, that's not the whole truth, <laughs> okay? It's true that there's a number that we associate with every fluorophore, but reality is more complicated than just a single color. Every fluorophore actually reacts to a spectrum, plural is spectra. So that just means a variety of colors. So, excitation wavelengths that work for a particular fluorophore, for instance, for Fitzy, it's not just 495. 494 works, 496 works, but 550 does not work. So, there's a spectra of colors that do work to excite your fluorophore. And there's a shape to the curve I'm going to show you where the peak, the best one, is, is the one that we refer to. We say 495. We mean the peak uh, of the curve. We mean the best possible color, the one that it, react, it prefers, it reacts to the most. But there's a gradient. It reacts to the what colors near there, too. The same thing happens when we look at emission. Your fluorophore is going to emit, yeah, five, uh, what did I say, 514 or something like that. We'll just say 514. But in truth, it emits 513, 512, 511, 510 a little bit, 509 a little less. On the other side, you know, 514, yeah, and 515 and 516, 517, less so, 5 anyway. So there's a curve in terms of both excitation and emission. This is a really important concept to grasp about fluorescence. And so here is, in fact, Fitzy's real self, <laughs> the real truth about Fitzy. This is what is really going on with Fitzy. So um, we might, we might, we do sort of shorthand it because we've got to describe Fitzy uh, when we're talking, thinking about it, planning an experiment. Am I going to use Fitzy? Am I going to use another floor for? Um, we just say excitation 495, emission 520. But in truth, every floor four has um, its own excitation and emission curves. And Again, this is where you're going to be ahead of the crowd when you know this, oddly enough, because it's a very basic thing about fluorescence. <laughs> and when you're planning an experiment or figuring out if you can see the particular fluorophore on your particular scope, given the filter cubes that you have, you got to go back to basics and you got to look up your fluorophore and look up the curves and um, figure it out. And you're going to know how to do this by next week, because that's next week's lab. So uh, the good news is these are published. Uh, even better news is you it's pretty easy to figure out. Um, there's all sorts of spec, uh, spec machines, spectro, uh, what are they? <laughs> Spectrophotometers <laughs> are machines that figure this out. Everyone just calls them specs. And uh, if you have a confocal, there's a way to do it. Um, it's just. You know, you throw light, uh, the different colors of light and see um, how much it reacts. The important thing is to know when you're looking at this um, that, oh, let me see. I think I'm going to have to bother to switch to annotation for this. Um, so the important thing is to know that any excitation color can give you any emission wavelength. I must say that again. Any excitation color can give you any emission wavelength. So I'm taking a second to try and annotate this. 
once I've started recording, it makes the commands kind of hard to find. Let me see if it'll let me do that. Okay. So, okay, so let's say, I'm gonna try to draw an arrow. <laughs> Sorry, badly drawn, not on my tablet. Let's say we excite with a light, like right there where this line is. So let's say that's, oh, uh, good Lord, five. Oh, sorry. Let's just, can't hit on dope. Ignore the little puddle. Let's say that's light of 500 you will still get this same emission curve. So if you use light that is wavelength 500, you will still get a series of colors spanning from, um, you know, actually five, close to 500, but they'll probably be a little further away. Let's say five, 515 or 520 with a peak at five. 520 because that just is always the peak and on down to colors all the way into the red. But most of the colors um, that you'll get out are green. The majority of the response of your fluorophore is going to be green, but some of it will actually, a few fluorophores in your specimen are going to give you red. You give them 500, they give you 650. It's a curve, it's a spectra. There's variety basically. Um, and same thing if you, so if you throw in 495, you're gonna get the same curve that you you get if you throw in 510 light. Um, you might get, you'll get a dimmer curve, like you'll get less of a response. You'll get the, the most response, the most fluorophores responding if you use the peak. But any of those other colors could work. But of course, if you use something like 450, you're going to get such a weak response that you won't even be able to see it on your scope. So, oh, let me do undo. Yeah, let's get rid of those bad lines. Okay. So, in other words, <laughs> any color that you use out of a possible spectrum will give you a variety of emission colors. So any excitation color you use, you can use a, a choice of them, right? And any of them will give you an emission and it will give you an emission spectrum. Um, but it might be a kind of dim. <laughs> it might be a small peak if you if you choose a wavelength, an excitation wavelength that doesn't particularly excite that floor for. Um, you're going to get a very dim um, image. And that's a big issue with fluorescence. We're always trying to see the brighter image, the better, because fluorescence images are just generally dim. This is why you don't know about it with your own eyes, because you look at rocks and you're like, I don't see them fluorescing. Well, they are, but just not at the level that your eyes can pick up. We need a scope. We need extra bright light, <laughs> like super intense bright light that would hurt our eyes to look at. And um, we need some really sense, we need the scope to sort of concentrate that light and we need some sensitive um, equipment to capture it and so on. Of course, once it's in a scope and we've got that super bright light, you can see it through the oculars beautifully. Um, all right, so excitation. The idea is try to, try to hit your fluorophore with the best possible color, the peak emission color. That's the color it prefers. But close to the peak, your results are gonna be pretty similar. Far away from the peak, and you're gonna start getting some really dim results. And even further away, you're not gonna see anything happen at all. And any case, no matter what wavelength you end up hitting your, exciting your specimen with, you're always going to get a broad range of emission colors, with a majority of them being the color that I said, you know, we first said a fluorophore fluoresces at a certain color, you know, that's the main color, but there are other colors that are happening too, always. Okay, so, <laughs> okay, let me get out of this annotation thing while you think about that stare at this, redraw this. This is next week's lab assignment, actually. 
um, to you know, understand this to the level where it's intuitive and you can tell non-scientists, this is what happens with light. When you shine light at things, this is going on all the time and we just didn't know it. Let's see if it'll let me pick there. Okay. Um, oh, this is just showing you the same thing. <laughs> Am I gonna have a little gray spot on everything? Let me go back and, uh, yeah, annotate is so weird in Zoom. It's like once you annotate something, it thinks it, you want it on every slide. Sorry, just a second till I can clear all drawings. Okay. And get out of there. Um, so this one is showing you the stoke shift, just drawn on the same exact chart, pointing out that. Um, there we go. Pointing out that you can, of course, see the stoke shift on these 520 minus 495. It's um, uh, 25 nanometers. And there's a great tutorial here. Let me know, y'all, if you can't, if you're having trouble um, getting the links from the PDF or anything like that. Um, so why do we need to remember that excitation and emission wavelengths aren't actually just one wavelength, that they're actually a spectra, there's a curve. We're talking about the peak of the curve because um, anytime you're doing fluorescence, you need to know about this. You need to do a, think about this and understand this and have that knowledge when you're selecting the filter cubes that you're going to use for um, imaging. You absolutely you have to know this when you're going to use multiple fluorophores so multiplexing so even if you're just using one color which filter cube am i going to use as you'll see soon you don't always have the perfect filter cube but because there's a whole spectra you might be able to see the fluorophore you want using the filter cube meant you know originally intended for a different fluorophore if you know the spectra and you know what the filter cube is you can work it out um, when you're using multiple fluorophores, you must work it out <laughs> because otherwise you're going to get into all sorts of trouble, including lies. You don't want imaging lies. You want your images to be the truth because we're scientists. I'm going to, uh, you're not going to learn about the lies yet. It's the next lecture, but there are ways in which your image can lie to you if you don't know what you're doing. It's not trying to lie. It's just you don't know enough and you're not paying attention. So in confocal, we actually do shine light um, that is just one color because they're lasers. And so again, you might not have the laser that's 495. In fact, you don't, um, <laughs> but you might have a 488 laser. So then you go, in fact, you do, it's more common. So then you, you go and you look at the spectrum and go, well, I know it wants 495, that's its favorite color, but will it be okay with 488? Is, you know, am I going to get enough response? And you look at the spectra and you can go, yeah, you know, yeah, that'll, it'll work. Um, it's very, very, very important if you're trying to quantitate things, right? You can imagine knowing whether I'm exciting all the fluorophores or just some of them, et cetera. So, um, you need to know what you did, what fluorophore you had, what light you gave it. The filter cubes don't give it one color, they give it a spectra too. So when you're interpreting your data, you need to know all of these things to know, was I giving it the brightest light? It's, you know, the light that gets the most response. Was I capturing the peak of the response or was I way off? And um, in, did I get something known as bleed through, which is the lies I was talking about before. That's when your image accidentally lies to you. Um, it's basically when data from one color shows up in a different colors uh, image, different channel. And if you, you don't know what you're looking at, you can be fooled. So let's look at um, some spectra. Basically, now we're just looking at the spectra of a particular fluorophore. I've drawn the, I put these little um, rectangles of colors above these because um, 
Okay, so here's Fitzy again. You've seen it before. This is a different representation of it. And um, it's showing you the excitation wavelength and the emission, you know, which is which, because you know the one to the left is excitation, the one towards the right is emission, right? That's just, that's Stokes' law. It's going to be that way all the time. So you know which, which spectra, which curve is what. Um, but I noticed that they always draw one as blue and one as red, even though they're, those colors aren't the colors we're talking about. So I drew the colors up top for you. So this is actually a fitzy, you give it green light and it gives you green, I mean, sorry, you give it blue light and it gives you green light. That green is not pure green. It's got some orange and yellow and a little tiny bit of red in it, but it's gonna look to your eyes through the oculars green. Um, and the light that you're giving it is gonna be blue light. Um, now there's you know many types of blue light, but it's blue light. Just generalizing that. EGFP is another fluorophore that stands for enhanced GFP. It's the formal official name of GFP, which is green fluorescent protein, which is a favorite fluorophore because humans went through a lot of trouble to figure it out and be able to use it. Um, jellyfish invented it, actually. We just discovered how we could use it. And um, and you're going to learn a little bit about the history of that real soon. But um, enhanced GFP is the you know better updated version. <laughs> so eGFP, also a fluorophore that if we're just generally remembering it, it's a blue excitation and a green emission. And you can see already that slightly different blues it responds to, and so it gives you a slightly different spectra for emission, but it's kind of similar to Fitzy. Alexa 488 is the other famous green. <laughs> um, if we have to pick a color, we talk about the color that um, we see. So we think of these as green, like green fluorescent protein, likes blue light, but it gives us green. Same thing for Alexa 488. So um, Fred Hogland is a scientist up in um, Seattle, I think, with a company called Molecular Probes that really developed all the fluorescent probes that we use. And um, with Fitzy, has been used a long time. It's actually something that you may have had uh, in your own eyes uh, because optometrists <laughs> use it when they dilate your eyes. Um, so it's used in a lot of circumstances, but it, its properties are not, there's other properties we're going to tell you about soon that make it less, a little hard to use. And so molecular probes de decided we're going to make some better, more stable um, fluorescent probes once, um, you know, anyway, in the 90s, basically, once people started using these scopes a lot more. And uh, he came up with the Alexa series named after his first daughter, not after anything uh, to do with artificial intelligence. This was an actual person. I, I get amused by this because he had two kids <laughs> and the other kid, the son, <laughs> didn't, get a, didn't get a whole series of floor fours named after him. But there's a whole series of Alexas um, and the, this one, and they tell you, this one's Alexa 488, it's the first, most widely used one. Ironically, 488 is not its um, favorite peak emission. It's more in the 490s. However, that's the laser line that a lot of people use for it. So I think that's why it got that name. Um, so anyway, here's another floor for, they're all good friends. You want to get to know these. And in fact, we're going to have a memorization online uh, activity around those this in two weeks and there's going to be teams. Um, so after spring break, basically. Okay. Uh, Mito tracker red. I realized I kept saying next week, but um, we've got spring break coming up. So anyway, Mito tracker red is another floor for um, that is really famous. It's actually uh, directed. It attaches itself to mitochondria. So it's super cool. 
and it's a green to red, you can see the shape of the curves is slightly different for different uh, fluorophores, right? And again, there's that Stokes shift that's in the 20s. So the excitation emission peaks are close. And oh, yeah, they actually overlap, right? Um, here's the same information. Well, except, well, same thing in the sense that it's an emission excitation spectra. It's just for the original GFB, and it's just drawn differently. So just here's Fitzy again from a different source. Um, this one very confusingly draws the excitation uh, as green when the excitation is blue and the emission is blue when the excitation is green. I, so what were they thinking, really? Like, were they even paying attention when they were doing this? Um, so don't get confused by that. Look at the numbers, know what you know, which is Fitzy, you know, is excited by blue colors. Oh yeah, look in the 400s, that's blue and gives off green colors, despite however this artist drew these curves, okay? And there's EGFP, same data, just a different rendition of it. I don't know why they didn't take it all the way down to the baseline, whatever. Um, just showing you that uh, there's many ways people depict these, but the idea is the same. Here's a new one you haven't seen. So cyan fluorescent protein, enhanced cyan fluorescent protein. Um, so it also is a blue to green, despite what these silly colors are. DAPI, DAPI is one that you must befriend. It's the one that binds to the nucleus. It's a very odd one because it has a large stoke shift. Look at that big fat stoke shift. A little difficult to deal with. Um, unlike what it says on my slide, remember, it's not that the bigger the stoke shift, the better, it's the smaller, the better. And also, um, you know, a right sized smaller. There is such a thing as too small. So here's DAPI. Um, also, it, this is actually, um, you might notice, it's not really blue It's uh, that excites it. It's uh, pre blue, if you will, <laughs> which we call like UV, okay, ultraviolet. So not just violet, but ultraviolet. And um, in truth, we often don't have access to light of 350 nanometers, which you know it would love. We're often exciting it actually right at the end of its curve at like 405, which is like, good Lord, we're barely giving it the light it likes. But fortunately, DAPI fluoresces is uh, very strongly and we can still see all those uh, beautifully blue stained nuclei that you see in a lot of images. I mean, Yes, it's so it's UV to blue. So they are blue actually. Texas red is guess what color <laughs> in terms of emission, right? It's red. <laughs> and I assume it was developed in Texas. I'm not sure. Uh, but again, this one is uh, comes in a you excite it with green and it gives you red. This is an old fluorophore. Another classic fluorophore is Tritzy, uh, which is red, also a red fluorophore. In other words, give it green, it'll give you red. And this is a beautiful little chart um, I love so much of the fluorescent protein. So GFP was the first protein that we were able to, you know, get the DNA for it and then give instructions to cells to make that protein. Because what cells do basically is make proteins. A lot of these other um, fluorophores are tiny little molecules that are not natural. They're not part of cells. They're not toxic either. They're just chemists have come up with them. And this is, um, the GFP is actually biological. It's uh, something a jellyfish uses. And, um, and so the nice thing is there's a gene for it and we know it and we can put the gene into anywhere we want that anything living, which has genes, which is everything, except for viruses, everybody else has genes. And um, I shouldn't say except for viruses, they kind of have genes too. But, uh, but coming back to these charts, we can genetically encode these fluorescent proteins so we can make parts of a living organism fluoresce. Um, and they can be like entire organs or they can be certain proteins inside of certain cells. And after GFP, 
was discovered and you know we have this whole revolution they quickly came up with these other fluorescent proteins this is from the early days but what's really nice about this is it shows you that there's fluorescent proteins all across the visible light spectrum so on one side you're seeing excitation um, all of them drawn in so uh, blue fluorescent protein cyan green yellow was the second one invented and then um, took a while to get red, but we got DS red. And so here are the colors that you can use to excite these various proteins. Oh, and then on the over here on the right, you've got the emission colors that correspond to those. So this time it's not excitation emission on the same chart. It's a chart of all the excitation spectra and then all the emission spectra just to kind of look and compare and realize that you can you you've got all the colors possible there's actually way more than these now but this already covered it in the early days okay so that's your nugget to digest for now is basically it's not just a number for excitation and emission it's a whole spectra of numbers, okay? So the real truth behind the, the, the simplified truth, the simplified truth is a fluorophore uh, has an excitation wavelength that it likes and an emission wavelength, and we're gonna name them. The real truth, the bigger truth, the more in-depth truth is that actually there's a lot of colors of light that will work to excite it. There's a spectra of them, there's a curve of it. Um, some more than others. And there's also, every time you excite it, there's also a variety, a spectra of colors that you will get out as emission colors, but some are statistically way more probable than others. So you'll mostly get, you know, certain colors out, of, but you will get a variety. Biology is all about variety. Everything in biology is variety once you start digging. Okay, so what fluorophores are there out in the world for us to use and look at? I have organized them into four categories. This is my own organization. It's true, but not everybody would necessarily organize them this way. Um, so this is just, I think, a handy way to think about them, especially when we're thinking about the science that goes along with them. So some fluorophores are chemical molecules that we can attach to something like an antibody. And Fitzy, Tritzy, Texas Red, all of those first fluorophores that launched fluorescence microscopy were usually attached to an antibody so that you could use Fitzy to selectively label certain parts of a cell or certain parts of uh, embryo or certain organs or something like that. We want to be selective when we're doing fluorescence. The point is we're not seeing everything. We're only seeing the thing we're trying to see. We're asking a question where we're like, what are their neurons doing? Or more specifically, what are the mitochondria in the neurons doing? Or more specifically, what is a certain protein in the mitochondria of the neurons doing? So we don't want to see everything. We have maybe a bright field image too, just to get the context, um, maybe a nice DIC image, but we want to specifically look only at certain parts of the picture, basically. Um, so one way to do that is to use an antibody. Antibodies are proteins that our immune system um, has invented to stick to very specifically, very beautifully to certain things. We know right now we're all obsessed with getting the right antibodies to COVID. Why is that? Does the antibody kill COVID? No. <laughs> Your immune system kills COVID when it's labeled with the antibody. So the antibody, what it does is it's good at sticking to sort of one thing and one thing only ish. <laughs> Again, in biology, no, nothing's ever that uh, linear. But um, antibodies are pretty specific and they will stick to, for instance, only SARS-CoV-2 and not other viruses if they're the antibodies for SARS-CoV-2. Um, so can we use those antibodies to fluorescently label um, viruses inside of us? Of course we can. <laughs> we just take the antibody, chemically link it to Tritzy Fitzy or any of the Texas Red or something like that, and then throw it on and image. 
Um, throwing it on part is not as simple as it, it sounds, but we know how to do that kind of thing. So those are the conjugatable fluorophores. You can chemically link them to something else. And in that, and when we're doing these experiments, um, the cells or the material we're looking at is dead. It's fixed with formaldehyde. So it's embalmed. So nothing's moving. <laughs> Everything's frozen as it were. Um, so we cannot, for instance, fluorescently follow COVID descending in your body um, using a conjugatable fluorophore because you've got to fix things. So we can get a snapshot in time. Permeabilized cells just means that we poke holes on them with soap so that things can go into them. So there's all cell prep that goes with this um, using conjugatable fluorophores. Then there are some dyes that were developed um, pretty early on um, by Roger Chan and others, you're going to hear about him in the uh, GFP lecture. Um, these are fluorescent, small fluorescent molecules that have a trick um, in that they can actually go across our plasma membrane, which is a big trick because most things do not cross. The plasma membrane is the outer fatty layer of cells, basically. And the whole point is to keep things out. And there's some protein stuck in there, which let things in if they so choose. But your cells are pretty good at protecting their interior from things outside. A lot of medicine is about, can I get things into the cell <laughs> that I'm trying to get into the cell? Because like I said, your cells, your tissues, your body is actually quite spectacular um, at keeping things out that it needs to keep out. Um, so there are, however, some molecules where that can go across and then they get stuck inside because there's enzymes that keep them inside. So there are some cell permeant dyes that are fabulous to work with because they're really easy. You don't have to fix and stain and do all this. You just have to add them to your tissue or cells or whatever and voila, they go inside. <laughs> and even and your, your cells are alive, everything's alive. Nuclear dyes are their own category of fluorophores because the, it's so important to see the nucleus. Everything has DNA or RNA. It has nucleic acids that we're looking at if it's a lot, if it's life, right? And um, there's just so much information in looking at the DNA. So there's a whole series of dyes that specifically dye the nucleus. And almost always, if you're going to bother to um, prepare your specimen and look at other things, you're almost always just going to do adequate DAPI to, <laughs> to your specimen. So you can kind of see where the nucleus is, what's going on, is it the right shape, is it a healthy cell, how close am I to the nucleus, etc. There's just lots of info there. And then last but not least, of course, are our faves um, uh, of this program, because there would be no program without them. They're the uh, fluorescent proteins. So GFP and the others, these are proteins. Proteins are big fat molecules, y'all, okay? The others are teeny tiny, like a you know, few atoms or something. Well, a few dozen. Uh, proteins are compared to these other things are big honking molecules, but they're also natural to the cells. We can genetically encode them and the cells themselves now are forever more fluorescent with uh, whatever part we have decided to make fluorescent. And they can, so we can genetically encode them permanently or we can just add them temporarily with, through something called transfection. Um, so we can sort of add them to cells for, and see, visualize them for a few days, or we can um, make a whole cell line that goes on forever, or a bunny that fluoresces or whatever. This has all been done. Okay, so this is what you want to start memorizing for when we come back from spring break. Um, so, and this is kind of a merit microscopy program tradition. It's very much like every language class you've ever had. You have to memorize some, you know, vocab. This is vocab of imaging. So here's the conjugated fluorophores and their favorite excitation and emission numbers. Um, so the peak excitation emissions. Starting with Alexa fluorophore 88, you see that it 
actually prefers 495. <laughs> yeah, it's called 488. What? I think that was just a marketing move to tell people your 488 laser that you already have will work with this thing, even though the spectra says 495 is what it wants. Um, it tells me a lot of people didn't realize that 495 isn't the only color that can excite it. <laughs> In fact, they had a name at that. So uh, then there's Psi 3 and Psi 5. Also, these are conjugatable fluorophores, um, and you can see their excitation emission numbers there. Fifth C, which is also known as fluorescine. Fura red is a red, one of the first reds. Texas red and Tritzy are all reds. Um, so these are some of the more commonly used uh, conjugatable fluorophores. Then we've got the cell permeant dyes. The two that are most widely used are mitotracker red. Yes, you can just add it to cells and it'll waltz in and stain your mitochondria. Uh, they'll make them fluoresce red. Um, it doesn't always work that easily, but it is doable. <laughs> so there's some tricks and tips to, to making it really work. Calcium, on the other hand, goes in really nicely to anything, gives um, uh, stain cells green. It's used a lot in live dead assays. So you just throw it on cells, wash it off, and then um, cells that are alive are green. And then cells that are red are dead because um, we also thrown on a uh, a dye that is not cell permeant that stains the nucleus, which is actually the last one on the list there, propidium iodide. So nuclear dyes include DAPI, which we've already discussed, ethidium bromide, which you might come across in molecular biology. It's um, used in gels, it's toxic, and um, it does also fluoresce actually. And propidium iodide, which is used a lot. And I realized I don't have hooks on here. I thought I did. Um, well, there's another blue that DAPI is actually for fixed cells. And hooks, it, it, I'll write it up for you on a future uh, one, is um, actually just waltzes in, even in live cells, but it's kind of dim. So fluorescent proteins. Here are some of the fluorescent proteins. So cerulean, CFP, DS red 2 EGFP, GFP, M-cherry, and YFP. These are some of the more famous ones and their peak excitation and peak emission um, numbers. And I think that's it. Yes, that is it. Um, I'll try to write hooks for you in the commentary. Um, so what you have learned today is that it's not just an excitation and emission wavelength, it's a whole spectra. There's a spectra of colors that will excite your, a particular fluorophore, and every time it's excited by any one of those colors, um, then you will get an emission spectra. You will get a variety of colors coming off as the emission. Most of them will be you know, near that peak. A fluorescent um, molecule or fluorophore has a known stoke shift. So that's the difference between the two peaks, right? Excitation and emission peak, subtract them. What's the distance? How many nanometers? That's a stoke shift. Just for um, sort of being complete, the other two properties of, of a fluorophore that we haven't discussed yet are photostability and quantum efficiency. So that's the next lecture. Uh, photostability is basically how long can you keep using and imaging this molecule, which is a big issue. And quantum efficiency is it ends up being how bright is it. So we want things to be stable, bright, and bright. We want to know what the spectra is. We want a smallish Stoke shift, and um, we just need to always remember that it's not just an excitation and emission number, it's a whole variety of colors that work both to excite and then a whole variety of colors that you'll get when you've excited, you will get a whole variety of colors emitted out. And the next lecture is going to be more about fluorophores and we're going to talk about filter selection, bleaching, multiplexing, so there's the word I've already mentioned, bleed through, and after that, and uh, I think about a week after that, we'll talk more about GFP. So there you have it. Enjoy knowing more about fluorescence and be sure to study this as well as you can because we're gonna, 
you need to understand the spectra, look at some spectra, because the next thing up is what do we do with that knowledge now that we know that my fluorophore has a whole spectra of colors that it likes to be excited by and it, it will admit, what, how are we gonna match a filter to it? 